women's title. Um, it's monthly devotional and fellowship. We do this once a month. Um, we go ahead and now currently are going to be meeting at the Village Grill. We did this last month. Barbara went ahead and met with some of the ladies. I, of course, was at a wrestling tournament with my daughter that day, so that was just not possible. But um, I will be there this time. So January 6th at 9 a.m. at the Village Grill. Um, we usually have one lady that kind of takes turns going ahead and doing a devotion. Please. Here it is. Angels we have 
seated.
Christmas song. Second coming. for the last song.
Savior is born. Christ the Savior is Father, I, what can we say? Thank you for loving us so much, for you so loved the world, you so loved us, that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. He was on that cross, he was scourged, he was beaten, he was tortured, he was nailed to the cross, he was on that cross for six hours of torture, and he did it to take our place, to take our punishment. It's just incomprehensible to our little minds. But Lord, we have faith. It's all about faith. It's all about trust. It's all about believing that you are the Savior of the world. And we believe it. We believe it. So Lord, save us and always be with us. And we look forward to that day when we will stand before you, faultless, as Jesus Christ is standing next to us with a big smile on his face. And he says, Father, this is one of mine. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Uh, before you take a seat, let's go ahead and take a minute and greet one another. We'll start the message in a couple minutes. I always hate breaking up good fellowship and um, all of that, but I do need to get us into the Word here this morning. And I just want to start by sharing um, and saying thank you to uh, many of the ladies and probably some men too, who helped us uh, through the whole year, basically last year, of making more blankets. and qu I can't even imagine the number of blankets that we've made as a church for Mexico and for senior centers. Hats off to those ladies, and you know who you are, uh, or ladies who have purchased blankets. And, you know, I can't even, I should have kept a tally all these years, but I haven't. But um, thank you to everyone who has... Uh, donated blankets, made blankets, help us to package them, um, even the little care packages that we put together with lotions and little socks and booties and, uh, you know, some uh, just good care packages. And so what we did is we went yesterday, loaded all those up. I think we had 60 blankets and I don't know how many care packages. It was a lot. But we took it to uh, my grandma's uh, senior home where she stays in Chino Hills, and um, it was my grandma's 92nd birthday, and so some of the family gathered there together, and we are friends with Rose, who is the director, activities director at that Oakmont um, Senior Center, and for the last two years, we've went, one year I preached for them, I gave them a little Christmas message, um, and then we distribute, you know, blankets, uh, things that are just items of, of affection and love, right? I mean, the smile on those seniors' faces who 
you know, they don't get out much. They're there in that home, and, you know, some of them family comes, but probably not as often as family would want to come and those sorts of things. So we distributed the care packages. My kids, I love it. Uh, you know, my kids were there walking through the dining hall, distributing uh, these gifts and just saying Merry Christmas and and these sorts of things. And the smiles on the seniors' faces, you know, are, are priceless. And so that was a blessing. The blankets are being handed out today uh, to the memory care facility, uh, which is the facility, you know, they have two different classifications in there. They have the people who can, you know, they're not as mobile, um, but their faculties are still there for the most part. But then you have the memory care, those who are in dementia and these sorts of things. Um, so I think there were 60 uh, adults in that center, and we provided them with, I think it was 70 uh, blankets, uh, beautiful little tokens of just love, you know, and, and I'm excited for next week's message already because this season is, it's about giving, guys. Uh, it's all about giving. I mean, we gave these little tokens, you know, that, that took some blood, sweat, and tears maybe or some financial resources to put them together. But just giving, you know, and, and we gave kindness. You know, I mentioned Thursday night in the message, we talked about how God is so generous. And I hope I helped us all to understand that, that generosity isn't just tangible things, right? God gives us so much more than tangible things. And so we as Christians now can give. You know, I mentioned just giving kindness, you know, kindness doesn't cost me anything. It doesn't matter if I have negative uh, $20 in my bank account or 1000 I can still give kindness. I can still give a smile. I can still give a hug. I can still give a good word. I can still be the light in a dark situation. You see, these are all opportunities to give. And, and God has really been impressing this on me the last two weeks because it's Him who has given us everything. In fact, we're going to look at this in the study here today, that it's Him who created everything that is in existence. Nothing that we see, hear, touch, or smell came into existence apart from God. He's the Creator. He gives life. He gives light. He gives everything to us, and He continues to give to us daily. And what a beautiful thing that is. And so it's just a beautiful thing when we are an extension of God's generosity and we just love people. Isn't that what Jesus told us to do, right? To go out into the world and to show, to radiate that light that now is living within us. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so thank you to everyone who was a part of that. You know, it's going to be credited to your account. That was part of the message on Thursday too. Not everyone here knows everything that we do. And if we're right Christians, we should not care about people knowing or not knowing but we have to understand that God knows and that God sees and God credit it, credits it to our account, right? And that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Nothing is in vain. We shouldn't do it for those reasons. We do it because God compels us to do it because God has given us so much. But then on top of that, God just puts that beautiful cherry up there and says, oh, and by the way, when you get into my presence, guess what? All these things are going to come back to you sevenfold, right? Because God is a good God. And God is a generous God, and He is a God who blesses us. And so this is what we're going to look at here this morning. The title of the message is Life and Light, because really this is the greatest gift that God has given us, not just Jesus, His Son, and the perfect Lamb of God who would come to die for the sins of the world, but go back even further than that. God has given us life. He is the giver of of life. He's the giver of light, and nothing would be if it wasn't for life and for light. And so we're going to go all the way back here, preceding the birth of Christ, uh, as John does, and talk about Jesus being life itself, the very essence and principle of life, and He gives us life. What a beautiful thing. Uh, every breath that we take is a gift from God. Think about that. Every breath you take, even that breath when you, people are cursing God, God gave them that very breath and ability and speech to be able to curse Him. What a phenomenal, phenomenal God that we worship. And so let's pray here this morning and we'll get into uh, John chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 3 through 5 here this morning. Father in heaven, thank you, God, for another day this side of 
heaven, Lord. And I thank you for another opportunity, God, to bask in your glory, to enjoy your fellowship, to mingle with other like-minded brothers and sisters, to see the purposes, God, the purposes that you have that are all around us. And So many times I think we can be oblivious to your purposes, but I hope here today we're all reminded that you do have purposes, that everything is created with purpose and thought in mind. And so, Father, help us to see your purpose in our lives, that Yes, you have a purpose for each and every one of us. None of us were an accident. (laughs) Even if our mother and father didn't plan us, guess what? God did. God knew the very day that we would scream for the very first time after coming out of the womb. God, you knew uh, the hairs on our head before they were even there. And so, Father, help us to see that you have purposes, and this should encourage us uh, to keep us understanding your generosity and your goodness and your mercy and your grace. God, what a beautiful thing it is to see that you're the giver of all of these things. You're the giver of life. And so, Father, breathe fresh into us here today. God, maybe some of us come tired. Maybe some of us come in pain. Maybe some of us have some Uh, spiritual struggles going on within. Maybe we have physical problems going on. Father, fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the author and the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. Lord, that we may have a right perspective and see that even in our suffering, there's a purpose. Even in the wicked, as we see it, maybe even triumphing, yet you still have a purpose even for the wicked to remain in the world. You see, we don't always understand your purposes. But truly, we need to rest in the assurance of there are purposes. And so, I pray, God, that I would be able to bring this out through your word here today, that it would be your spirit weaving these truths into our mind and into our heart that would change us, God, that would change us for the better, more and more into your image and likeness, and that we would go forth being conquerors, Lord, with this message of power and authority of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the giver of life. And not just life as we know it, but eternal life. The life that has no beginning or no end, which is the destiny for all people, really. And so, Father, bless your word and bless your people, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so John chapter 1, verse 3, says, All things came into being through Him, And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. You'd have to listen back to the next two, last two messages, uh, the last two weeks, if you want to hear about verse 1 and 2. I think we spent ample time uh, trying to identify The Father, God, being there in the beginning, eternal, along with the Word that was there with God. And the Bible says here in John 1 that that Word was God as well. And so we see these beautiful pictures of the Trinity. We've been talking about that for the last two weeks. And so now here in verse 3, we read that not only was this Word in the beginning with God, eternal, uncreated, but now we're told that this Word is the one who is responsible for creating all things. That's what he says in verse 3, all things came into being through Him. Who is the Him referenced there? It's the Word. And so fascinating that being inspired by the Spirit, John the Apostle is writing these words, that it's the Word that was in the beginning with God, that is God, that is the one now responsible for creating everything. What a fascinating thing uh, that we uh, think about here, that it is the Word who, remember, the Word is Jesus. Uh, You can look down at verse um, 14 of John chapter 1 that identifies again, in case we were curious. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. And so this Word being Jesus... John here is telling us that Jesus was in the beginning with God. Jesus is God. 
and that Jesus is responsible for creating all things. Remember last week how I talked about consistency. And when we look at the Bible and we try to understand truth in the Bible, there needs to be a consistency. And, and why there needs to be a consistency is because uh, if the Bible is inspired by God, then there will not be any inconsistencies. In other words, you can't find a passage that would contradict another passage. And if it did, well, then it would not be inspired by God. It wouldn't be the perfect counsel, the perfect true Word of God. And so fascinating here that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John is writing about how this Word, or Jesus, is the Creator of all things. Look at the consistency now. Because the same Holy Spirit who inspired Paul also to write his epistles, in the epistle of uh, the Colossians, Paul, being inspired by the Spirit in Colossians 1, verse 15 and 16, writes that Jesus, and you have to read through that whole thing to understand he's talking about Jesus when he identifies him as the head of the body, of, which is the church. But he says that Jesus is the invisible or the image of the invisible God who is responsible for what? For creating all things. And he is the one who holds all these things together. So you see the consistency of the Spirit speaking to John and giving John the inspiration to write about this Word that was in the beginning, that was God, that this Word now is responsible for creating all things. Now Paul says the same thing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that it is Jesus who is the image of the invisible God who created all things and holds all things together. Consistency. Then you go all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And what does this passage say? It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so how fascinating that now Moses, thousands of years before, uh, the author of the Pentateuch, uh, the author of the book of Genesis, inspired by the Spirit, wrote that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What is the Bible telling us? Lo loop it all together. John, Colossians, and Genesis 1. That it was Jesus who was there in the beginning. That it's Jesus who is God, who has created all things. It's consistency from the Old Testament to the New piecing it together, showing the same message. What a beautiful, beautiful thing this is. And so Jesus, being God himself, is the one who is creating all these things. We see now that what John 1 says, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What an amazing, amazing thing. So Jesus being God, the Trinity, there in the beginning, responsible for creating all things. And why is this so important to my faith? Because it speaks of Jesus existing before the virgin birth that we're celebrating at Christmas. Because if Jesus was just born to a woman through the conception of a man and a woman and born just as you and I were, he cannot be God. He could not be the perfect Lamb of God because He would have been born into a sinful nature. Because there are some religions that say that, that Jesus was just born naturally like we were, and then He stumbled across John the Baptist one day and went out into the Jordan River and was baptized by John, and when the Holy Spirit descended down upon Him, then He became God. Well, guess what? He was still born as a sinner. He would be disqualified as the Lamb of God. His blood being shed would be no different than my blood being shed for you. A sinner dying for a sinner does not produce salvation. And so what an amazing thing. This is why I'm really spending time on this because I'm surprised, and I'm not being disrespectful, but I'm surprised because there is an overwhelming swell of people who don't understand the importance and the significance of Jesus being God and, and existing before the creation of all things. Because it was only, it could only be God. You know, it's not like God was sitting up in heaven one day and, and saw the sin of mankind taking place and God going, oh man, I better look for a man down there to save this world. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> 
It ain't going to happen. God said, I better do something. (laughs) I better become a man and dwell among them, put on flesh just like they have to identify with them, to then die for the sins of the world so that whoever believes in me will be saved. That's the only way we can be saved. It's the only way we can be saved. And so this is what the consistency of the Bible teaches, that Jesus is the word that was in the beginning with God And he was God, and he is now responsible for creating. Because if Jesus was just a man, he wouldn't have been able to pre-exist, and he definitely would not be able to create because he was created. You see, Jesus is uncreated, meaning he is eternal. He always is, always was, and will always be. That is why he's able to create, because he is a creator. Something created cannot create can't reproduce itself. Jesus is uncreated. He is eternal from the beginning. And so I love that because we see, again, pictures of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity of the Godhead. And so what a beautiful thing. But I love that it says back in John 3 that He, the Word, or Jesus, is the creator of all things, not just, you know, spiritual things, not just physical things. He is the creator of all things, and nothing that came into existence came in apart from him. You know, I love what Paul did in the book of Acts, because Paul understood this, uh, that God is the creator of everything. You see, for as long as man has been around, man has always had the same questions that you and I have, and woman. We look around, and at some point in our lives, we look around and we go, what is the purpose of all this? How in the world did we get here? Is there anything else out there? I mean, think about it. Before the the recent years in technology and satellites and telescopes, man didn't know a whole lot. They looked up enough, though, into the skies, and they looked and they said, wow, you know, there is obviously a force or a power that is greater than us because there's things out there we don't understand. There's these big balls of fire that are crossing through the sky, and we have no idea. It's light, then it's dark, and it's, you know, the rains. All of a sudden, there's water that comes from heaven, and I mean, what in the world? There's a force out there that is greater than us. Man has always, even the biggest fool, has at least been able to look up into the the stars and say there is something, some force, something greater than us. And so we see this in the book of Acts, that there was the days of the Greeks. This is in Acts chapter 17, that Paul stumbled into this Mars hill, which was there in Athens, Greece. And he went to this place where the Greeks were famous, and even still today, for worshiping many different gods. Uh, They worshiped sun gods. They worshiped Zeus. They worshiped all of these gods, all of these things that they looked out and they could not explain, but they very clearly saw there was some force out there. They gave them these deity forms. They said, that is a god. And so what Paul was doing here, knowing the truth and knowing the true creator of all things, having been revealed to him through the Spirit, Paul, being born again, being a follower of Christ, is now walking through Athens and he stumbles across this place where there was all of these statues to these gods, these false gods. And this is where the philosophers of the day, those men who uh, really wanted to reach and try to understand what all this is and how all this works. And, and so they would stand there in their long robes and their long white beards and, and they would talk philosophy and, and they would talk all of these things, trying to, to reach and to understand this force or this power or these gods. And so they had these statues there because they worshipped these gods. And so this is when Paul went to the one statue they had that was left to the unknown God. You see, they didn't want to offend any gods, right? Isn't it funny how man naturally has a fear of death and darkness already built into us? We have that fear of death and darkness already built in. So these Greeks were so afraid of all these forces that they could not understand. I mean, it'd be pretty frightening if you didn't know what lightning was and all of a sudden this bolt of light comes down and like fries stuff. You'd be like, whoa, don't want to offend that guy. So that's what the Greeks did. 
Just in case we didn't know about one of these gods, we're going to create a statue to worship this god, and they actually call it the unknown god. We don't want to offend. It kind of sounds like 2023. We don't want to offend any gods, so we better, you know, be friendly with all the gods. But what an amazing thing. I want to read this because Paul is trying to reach these intellectual people, you may say. And I wouldn't even say intellectual. I would just say it was people who simply looked up and said, something else is out here. Something else is going on. This is way too organized. You know, doesn't the Bible even say that, that the heavens declare the glory of God? Even a fool could look up and see, wow, you know, there's consistency in this world (laughs) You know, how do the clouds come over and they drop rain, then they go back over the ocean and they suck more water up and they come back over land, they drop more rain, they float upon the higher elevations of the mountains where the air is cooler and the rain begins to fall, it turns into snow, it covers the mountains, then the sun rises, the seasons change, the snow melts, it runs down the mountains, it fills the lakes, it fills, I mean, it's just amazing how you look out and you see, wow, you know, this is an accident. It's just an accident that, you know, we wake up every morning and everything keeps going the way that it keeps going. NASA's baffled as these comets are flying by us at light speed, missing us by fractions of of distances. And one of those, they're afraid if it hits the earth, it's going to knock us into some other orbit and we're all going to die. And, you know, how, how is that not, how is that kept from happening? How is that kept from happening? Well, I think God has a purpose. You see, we don't understand all of God's purposes, but we see the effects of God. See, that's why I'm not anti-science totally. Because what science does is it studies what God has done. That's the truest form of science, studying what God has done. But what science cannot do is tell us the purpose. Cannot tell us the reason behind it. We can see the effects. Remember, John even said that about the Holy Spirit. You don't see the Holy Spirit but you see the effects of the Holy Spirit, don't you? Just like the wind blowing, you don't see the wind, but boy, I, I feel that cold wind hit my face. I see that wind blow and I see the trees moving. It's the same idea. And so Paul says this to these philosophers of the day, trying to explain this God who has created all things, what John is talking about, what Paul has talked about, even way back what Moses was talking about, that God created all all these things. Paul says this in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 24. He says, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself, here it is, gives. He gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, For in him we live and we move and we exist, as even some of our own poets have said, for we also are his children, meaning that we've all been created by God uh, to become a child of God. We know we have to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, be forgiven of our sins, be filled with the Spirit, and we are adopted into the family of God. But here he's saying that all mankind came from one man, Adam and Eve. What an amazing thing Paul is saying here. But this God who has created all things, who is a part of all things, who is in all things. Amazing that he's not far from each one of us. Verse 28, in him we live and move and exist. What a fascinating thing. This is God, Jesus, who has created all things. And I love that because Paul understood these philosophers They were searching, they were groping, like Paul just said. And as you're doing that, let me explain to you about this true God. Let me tell you about this God. And see, Christians, this is what we should be doing too. You know, I love that 
God loves intellectual people. God loves people who don't care about intelligence or intellectualism. Uh, God comes to reach people wherever they're at. And I love that. You and I should be willing and ready to share simple truths like that with people. I mean, that's pretty simple to see. Because I know a lot of people who are into eschatology and these sorts of things. You know, meet people where they're at. And you say, well, I don't know anything about eschatology. Well, then study the Bible. Study the Bible. You know, God creating all things. Do you know that the Bible is the most accurate account we have as human beings? of a creation, of how all this came into existence. The Bible is the most preserved, accurate example or description of the how, the what, the where, the when, and the why. It's the Bible, and it's preserved for us. Let me just detail some of this, right? Because we're looking at John 3 that says, He is the one who created all things. Nothing came into existence apart from Him. Genesis 1 is fundamentally and foundationally incredible because just in genesis 1 1 what you have for any scientists out there you have time space and matter right here in verse 1 verse 1 says in the beginning there's your time god created the heavens there's your space and god created the earth there's your matter in the very first verse the bible gives us more information about how we got here and all of that then any other record, any other document, any other hieroglyphics on a wall, the Bible gives us the most detailed description of how God created these things. You can go on through this. I wish we would have went through Genesis. We'll go through Genesis after uh, Numbers maybe. But God created, remember there was darkness that covered over the earth, and so God did what? He said, let there be light. Then what what did God do? Well, He created the expanses. He separated the water from the earth. Purpose, remember that. God creates things with purpose. There was a purpose. Why? Because God didn't want the darkness to rule. In fact, we're going to look at this. The light, the darkness could not comprehend the light. The word comprehend means overpower. Of course the darkness can't overpower the light. That's why God said, let there be light. And guess what? The light shined in the darkness. Then God separated the waters from the earth. God created the vegetation. I love this. Isn't it fascinating that God created all of these things with purpose? There was a purpose why God created plants. And now, you know, years later, we come to find out photosynthesis and all of these things and uh, the benefits of having trees and you know, apart from the fruit that we get. And, and don't you find it amazing that when God did create vegetation and when he created trees i love this did he create the seed first or did he create the fully grown plant and tree fully grown plant and tree that held the seeds why is this important to me this tickles my mind because sometimes god goes outside of science (laughs) god says i'm not going to just create the seed so that you bury it in the ground and you let it grow up and it produces the tree. God says, no, I'm going to circumvent that whole process and show you that I am the creator of all things. Boom, there's a tree. Oh, and by the way, guess what? In that tree, you're going to find some seeds that will produce fruit. What an amazing thing. God creates all things. And why did, I mean, look, that's why science, it baffles me. It, it just, it tickles me. Because we begin to see some, some, of the reasoning and purposes and and how God makes these things exist and continue to exist and reproduce. But at the same time, we have to be careful because we can't explain everything. We can't understand everything. But God gives us these little nuggets in here. And I think the seeds and the tree are fascinating. Why? Because here's another one. When God created the first man, did he create him as this little tiny baby? He created him as a fully grown man. Then he created the woman from the man. Then they reproduced to have offspring. God circumvents science. And God is creative. He created a fully grown man. Amazing. God created everything. Genesis 1 is fascinating. All of Genesis. All of the Bible is fascinating. But Genesis 1 is the most detailed account of 
the hows, the whats, the whys, and the whens of any writings in the world. It's the Bible. And may I say it's because it's the truth. Imagine all the centuries that people have tried to disprove the Bible and the account in Genesis. Think about this. Science and anatomy. I love anatomy too. These bodies that we live in, these tents, are fascinating. And maybe your tent's breaking down a little. Guess what? That's the natural cause. Right? Visiting with my grandma, 92 years old. And it's just amazing to see the cycle of life. The life that we know on this earth. Not eternal life. There's two different lives here. The life that has been given to us that we know is life now. But we see the cycle of life, even in my grandma. I love my grandma. I love her to pieces, and she's doing great. She still has some of her faculties, but she's definitely, she's 92. And it's amazing that I was just sharing with somebody here this morning that when we're born and we're little babies, we don't know nothing. In fact, we're just, what, dependent on mommy and daddy, mainly on mommy at first for food and warmth and cuddling and all that stuff. But then what happens? We grow up and we become independent. Oh, I could not wait to turn 18. And then I wished I was 15 again when bills started coming and jobs and responsibilities and there was a cost to this independence. So we live most of our lives as independent, free beings, being able to choose and do whatever we want to do, even though there's consequences and we make our own path, right? The person who thinks they just ended up on a path is, you need to talk to me after church. It's the choices that we make that determine the destination we're on, right? Good choices or bad choices. We reap what we sow. But then what happens after this long period of time of us being independent? I don't need anyone. I don't need anyone's help. Do we? You bet we do. And how does that become more and more true? Usually the older and older we get. My grandma can no longer go to the bathroom herself. My grandma can no longer walk. My grandma wheels around in a wheelchair. My grandma can't get from point A to point B. Sometimes she can't even remember to get into bed. So somebody has to come and take her into bed. And So what is my point? My point is, is there's purposes and reasons for everything. And I think that cycle of life is to keep us humble. We are dependent, and we're not dependent on our caregiver per se. We're dependent on God. God is the one who gives us life. Do you know that God knows as much as we want to try to fight for our life, which is a natural human instinct to continue to live, that God knows the very day that that life is going to expire, no matter how much I want to try. Now, I'm not saying give up and you know stop fighting. I'm just saying look at the reality of this. You can hold your breath and close your eyes and count the ten and say, I'm not going to die, but guess what? If it's your time, you're going to die. There's a humbling in that. You know, seeing my grandma, who was always this, and she's still beautiful, but my grandma was just one of those ladies that was, you know, not prideful by any means. She was humble, but she really loved, you know, she wanted to dress up, and she always looked nice, and she always smelled nice. I remember that of my grandma. And she still tries to look nice, and she does, but we don't, what does it say, the flower, flower fades, <laughs> right? I mean, this, this shell, this body, eh, it's not eternal. It's not meant forever. But God has purposes in all these things. Because, you know, then I look at my kids, you know, who are 13 years old. And I mean, I was just going through so much at this little dinner table that nobody else had a clue, not even my wife. We were just talking and having a good time. Meanwhile, there's Gerald still talking and having conversations, but at the same time being ministered to by the Lord. And, and looking at this table and the generation gaps, you got the young little ones who have their whole life ahead and the grandma who's already, and, and, and the gap and us in the middle. And the, I mean, it's just fascinating. You see the cycle of life. And each stage of life having purpose. And, and I'll say this, what I walked away from that table with is the young kids need to respect the elders and the elders need to show the young people grace. Because <laughs> younger generation is going to make the same dumb mistakes that we made. Seniors, we have to, and I include myself in that notice, we have to show the younger generation grace. We still teach them the truth. We still model righteousness and what it is to love Jesus. But by golly, we better show them grace. And the younger generation, they need a whole lot 
of lessons, and one of them is respecting those older generations, because here's the truth of it. One day, (laughs) those young little kids are going to be old, right? It's the cycle of life, and I believe that how we treat others, right? God will not be mocked. Whatever a person sows, that too they will reap. You want to go kick and stomp all over the seniors? Well, guess what? You got a rude awakening coming because God sees that. Or you want to kick and scream at the youth and throw them to the trash? Guess what? You got a rude awakening coming also. But God has purposes. Everything has a purpose. And when we can understand that, there is a peace. There is a freedom. In fact, John says that this is actually understanding. John chapter 5. 1 John, I'm sorry, chapter 5. says this at verse 18, he says, We know that no one is born of God sins. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are God, we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Here you go, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life this is knowing life it's understanding it's having an understanding this is eternal life knowing God knowing that God has a purpose and his purposes are beyond you and I Just when I think I understand maybe a reason why God is doing something, God always tickles me, to use a word from Coley. Because God doesn't just stop where I stop, understanding His purposes. In other words, you may do just a good gesture, but have you ever heard of a ripple effect? You see, God has so many intricate details and things that he is working all at the same time that we maybe get a glimpse of one of his purposes. But truly, God has purposes for everything and there is an overwhelming use of his purposes. That's why just you and I being faithful, even in the smallest, most mundane things, when we are faithful and we are obedient to God, God uses it because God has purposes for it beyond our understanding. And so I thought about this when it comes to, this is probably where we're going to close. I didn't mean it to be a science lecture, but I got kind of tickled with this. About God having purposes. That everything was created by Jesus. Everything that has been created has come into being through Jesus. Everything. So we go back a few years before technology. And scientists who, you know, love to study the body, study the earth, we study everything, right? I mean, if you're curious, if God has given you a bend towards that to understand things, then you begin to study it. You look around, you try to figure things out, you gather resources, you can do these tests and these sorts of things. But I love that scientists, at one point before technology began to look at the body, and the body, as I said, is fascinating. The human eye is (laughs) amazing amazing but scientists used to look at the basics of the body right they cut open a body after somebody died and they begin to look around and, and do these different things before the recent times so they used to look at organs and it's fascinating to me because some organs made sense the heart you know i mean you can understand these things but it's fascinating there was actually a period of time early on in science When the scientists or these who were looking at anatomy were looking at organs and they actually looked at the appendix. And the general consensus was that the appendix was really what they call vestigal. Meaning they didn't think that it really had a purpose for being there in the body. That it was just some remnants of maybe some greater part of an organ that just kind of is fading away and really has no purpose. But yet it's there in the body. Fascinating. These were the wise people of the day who were doing what? Well, I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're trying to just understand what God has created. But here's my point. We aren't going to always understand everything 
and God's purposes. So these scientists looked at the appendix and thought that it was just a vestigal. They also later on began when we found out there was this stuff called DNA, (laughs) which is very important. But they actually couldn't understand all these different thousands and billions and trillions of strands of DNA. So some of it made sense, and they saw purpose in the DNA, but the other strands they couldn't find purpose in, so they actually labeled them junk. Scientists. It's junk DNA. It really doesn't have a purpose. It's just there, right? Don't we love to do that? Things we can't understand, what do we do? We discount them. Man, eh, just, that guy's just crazy. Oh, I don't need that. My wife tells me every time I work on the car and I, you know, put everything back together and I come back in the house and I say, wow, I got three bolts left over. How does that happen, right? Well, they just, why well, they probably don't need them until you're driving down the road and the tire falls off or something, right? It's there for a purpose. So what did we come to find out after technology advanced? Well, we came to find out that that appendix that is vestigal, of no use, it's just kind of, you know, trash. Well, it actually happens to be more like a safe house for good bacteria. So that after you and I have some illness or sickness or disease or something like this, this safe house begins to repopulate our digestive system with good bacteria. Good thing they didn't say, guess what? We don't need that. Cut it out. See, here's my point, though. Just because we don't understand things doesn't mean that it doesn't have a purpose. The Bible says that God has created everything, and everything has a purpose. Even the appendix, you bet. That's why I say these bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. It's fascinating. How about that junk DNA? What did we come to find out about that junk DNA? Well, it's vital. (laughs) It actually plays a vital role in the human genome. There is no junk DNA. If God put it in there, guess what? There's a purpose for it. There's a reason for it. That's why I say I'm going to hold on to all the things I have, you know, until I absolutely have to, you know, have something cut out because it's there for a purpose. Now, they fail sometimes and this and that, and, you know, we have to make these changes, but... God created everything, and he created it with purposes. And so I say this to just have us all take a moment here today and to remember these things. This is kind of a step back through the in-depth study, but I, I, I just feel the need. God, God is the giver. This is the giving season. God has given us everything. He's the giver of life, not just life as we know it, He's the giver of life itself, the very essence of life. Remember when he created Adam from the dirt? And Adam was what we would call a biological form of life. What did God do to that biological form of life? He breathed a breath of life into that biological being. So he is the creator of biological life, and he is the creator of life itself, eternal life. Or as 1 John said, the understanding. To know God is eternal life, because God gives us understanding of who he is, that he is the creator of all things. So when you're out there puddling around today, keep that in the back of your mind, that this giant ball of earth that God had created is spinning In fact, who was it telling me? I think it was Nathan the other day. Any um, snipers out there? Maybe Jim? I don't, don't quote me on the exact distance, but he was telling me that over a certain shot, maybe it was a thousand yards, that the guy who's calculating, you know, all the distance and and the whatever the code is. They actually had to make certain adjustments because out that far, a thousand, the bullet traveling that speed, the rotation of the earth actually comes into play. (laughs) Think about that when you're out walking around today, that you're spinning on this ball that's going so fast. And here I just thought I was dizzy. No, I wasn't dizzy. The earth's spinning. I mean, it fascinates me that God has created all these things with the purpose. And what was the purpose for that? That you and I could be stuck to the ground. (laughs) 
that there could be gravity and we're not floating out into the space. I mean, God is amazing. And when we come to know that God, I have pretty good nights sleeping knowing that that God is still the one who's, you know, managing things. As much as this earth and people on this earth can destroy this earth and destroy people and let evil and wickedness rule and reign, thank God there's still a God there (laughs) that is doing what's holding all these things together. And so I think all of this to say a good reminder today is that God is a very good engineer. He's the one who has created everything that has come into existence and He's created it with purpose. You see, Proverbs 16 says this. Proverbs 16, verse 4, says, The Lord has made everything for its own purpose. And look at this. Even the wicked for the day of evil. God has created everything with purpose. That cute little baby. But wait a minute. God has also created the wicked for a purpose. Now we know, I believe people are given opportunities to be saved from that wickedness, but point blankly, as John 1 says, they did not comprehend the light. People don't come to the light. But I find it amazing to me, and this gives me even peace to some degree, knowing that there's a purpose for everything, even evil, because what do I hear more times than not from non-Christians who find out I'm a pastor? Well, if God is so good, then why is there so much evil in this world? Well, that verse says that God has a purpose for evil, for the wicked. Let me give you two reasons. Again, I just said there's a purpose, and some of these purposes we don't understand, and we will not understand. But sometimes the Bible gives us purposes. Let me give you two purposes for God even having a reason for the wicked still in existence. Well, the first one is we may not like but it's true according to the Word. Isaiah 10 told us that God actually used the wicked Assyrians as a rod of God's anger against His own people. So God would use wicked people to discipline His people. When His people would sin against Him and not confess and repent of their sins, God would use and allow wicked people to come and be the rod of God's anger. Go figure that. What's another reason why God allows and has purposes for the wicked? Because remember, the wicked are created. Even Satan is created. Satan and God are not equals. They're not up there duking it out to see who's going to win in the end. God created Satan. Satan is not a creative being. He's not God. He's not eternal. It wasn't Satan there in the beginning with God. It was Jesus. But here's another reason that God has a purpose for the wicked. Well, there is going to be a day when God will have everyone stand before Him. The great white throne judgment. And so one of the purposes of the wicked is just for this, for God to show His justice. The wicked's purpose is for God to show His justice. Because those who reject His grace and His mercy in Jesus Christ will be judged. Will be judged according to their deeds. And so God is glorified through the showing of His justice. You see, Exodus 9, verse 16, what did God tell Pharaoh? The wicked Pharaoh who was persecuting and killing his people. Well, God told Pharaoh that I have raised you up to show my power in you. Fascinating. God is glorified even through the wicked. God says, I raised you up, Pharaoh, so that I can show my judgment and my justice upon you. How about this? Psalm 76, 10. God says that even God makes the wrath of man to praise him. Go figure that. God makes the wrath of man to praise him. How about the New Testament in Philippians? It says, on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. 
You see, God has purposes, guys. And you and I, one of our purposes is to stay away from evil. (laughs) Right? We don't want to entangle ourselves in the darkness. We are the light. We should have no part with the darkness unless God sends us into the darkness as a light. We better have a lot of people praying. We maybe better have a buddy or two with us as we go into the darkness to let the light shine so that we're not overcome by that darkness. But God has purposes for these things. And may I say that there may even be people who are in darkness who God has not come to judge yet because there's still some in the darkness who will come to the light. Because remember that, that you and I were dead in our sins and trespasses. God made us alive. So there's still other people out there who are in the darkness, who are dead, who God is waiting for His purposes and His timing to bring them to the light. At least to give them the opportunity to come to the light. And so what an amazing thing, guys. And so all that, just to be reminded that the Word, Jesus, is the one who has created all things, right? Amazing, amazing. So I hope tonight you're able to sleep in peace tonight, knowing that you are in the palm of this God's hand. Think about that. Think about how special you are. You are precious in God's sight. Isn't that amazing? The creator of all these things, who's doing all these things that we have no clue about. The Bible says that he has us in the palm of his hand. How comforting that must be. Maybe you're trying to jump out of that hand. Well, guess what? Jump back into the hand. Fix your eyes back on the author and the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. The one who was there in the beginning. The one who is the giver of life. Not just biological life. Not just this life. Life to come. And part of that eternal life is having the understanding of God. Think about that. That's why we're living in eternity right now. If we're born again, if we have the Spirit living within us. Why? Because God is revealing understanding to us. He's revealing us to Himself. He's making these dots begin to be connected little by little. Guess what? It's only going to continue. What has began here and now, the moment we bow our knees to Jesus, it never ends. We're on this path, and guess where the destination is? Oh, and by the way, in the middle of that path, this little transformation has to take place. (laughs) We have to shed off these old carcasses that are, you know, dwindling away anyways. We have to shed those things off, and then guess what? We get this new body that's going to be able to exist in uh, realms and spheres that we don't even comprehend. Amazing stuff. But you and I who's sitting here right now, we're eternal. If we're born again, we have the Spirit of God living within us. We are eternal. It's going to continue. To me, that's fascinating because God is fascinating. So I hope I just tickled you a little bit here today. I hope I brought a smile to your face because no matter how bad it is, guys, guess what? It can get better, and it will get better. And that's not some, you know, tricky little, oh, let's get out of here and feeling good. It's a truth. It's a truth. It's going to get better. Doesn't the Bible say that each day His mercies are new? Maybe you need some of God's mercy here today. Well, just call upon Him. Call upon Him and say, God, I need a touch. I need that peace. I need that understanding, God. Draw me into Your Word. That's my prayer here today for you. To be drawn more into His Word. Fall in love with the author of the word and then be that love. Be that transforming love in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, God, for today. And Lord, just thank you. I feel like this thing went all over. But I was touched by you, God. And I pray that through your words and some of my mumbling that somebody or many people were touched here today, God. If nothing else, that you would have given them a greater desire to get more into your word. Lord, thank you so much for this season and these reminders and impressing just how good you are to us, that you have created and given us everything. The very life that we have, this eternal life that never ends, you've given to us also. Just because we've come to you humbly and we've confessed 
that we missed the mark, that we're sinners. And we thank you for sending Jesus, who was with you in the beginning, who was glorified after he paid for the sins of the world there on the cross by shedding his blood, atoning for our sin. He was then glorified by being raised from the dead. Oh, guess what? Because what John said, that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not comprehend it. Guess what? The darkness could not win over the light. Jesus was raised from the dead. The light and the life of men cannot be contained by death and darkness. What a beautiful thing. That's why when it's all said and done and this transformation takes place, there won't need to be any more sun and moon and stars because it'll just be Jesus there in heaven that His radiant glory, which is light, will just be beaming, that will light up (laughs) everything. There will be no more need. Why? Because the light wins in the end. And so, Father, equip us and strengthen us. God, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our lapses of faith, Lord, for being entangled in fear. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive us for mumbling, Lord, at times, for not being grateful and thankful for looking too vertical or too horizontally and not more vertically. Lord, give us all that heart that I believe is your heart, that one that is ready to give, Lord, to give the smile, to give the compliment, and not just to try to stroke people's egos, but inspire us by your spirit, those moments, Lord, just to be the light, to be life. In dead places. Father, I just thank you. I thank you for everything you're doing. And Lord, bless our little church, Lord. Bless everyone who's here and those who will listen later. Lord, any physical ailments, Lord, whatever's going on, Lord, you know. You're aware nothing's caught you by surprise. Help us to understand maybe a purpose behind it. Maybe a reason. Maybe we just need to be patient. Ooh, I hate that word. Maybe we need a little more courage. Maybe our faith needs to be strengthened through all this. We don't always know, but God, we trust that you know. And that, Lord, you haven't allowed any of these weapons that have been formed against us to prosper. And so, Father, give us the strength and the courage to continue to be the light. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Beautiful. Please stand. Holy night, stars are brightly shine. It is the night of our dear Savior.
God bless you. Merry Christmas. Thanks for joining us today. We will see you next weekend for two services on Sunday.